Test, test. Oh, there it is. Okay. Test, test. There it is. Okay. There we go. All right. So, sorry about that uh, false start there. Um, like I was saying, tonight, I'm going to be doing a little Audacity uh, tutorial type thingy here. Um, and let's just go ahead and get to it. So, I figured I would do this live so that way if anybody was watching and they had any questions, uh, they could just ask. And I'd do my best to answer those questions for you guys. So, First off, let's open up Audacity. Let me, let me minimize this so you guys don't see that. And a um, couple of things here. I know one question that I keep getting asked uh, from other videos that I've posted is how I got Audacity to do this dark theme. So that's actually not too difficult. Um, all we have to do um, if we're on the Windows version. Actually, first off, before I, I even do that, um, why don't I check for updates? It's been a while since I've updated. Can you do that from here? Let's see. Yep, check, check for updates from the help menu. And let's see, what am I on right now? Latest version is 3.1.0. So let's see what I'm on right now. 3.0.2, okay, so I can update. So let's go ahead and do that first. And then we'll get on with everything. Just to make sure I'm running on the uh, most uh, current version. And I am using uh, Windows 11 here too, so just so you guys know that I'm on the most current version of Windows and going to be running the most current version of Audacity. So let's go ahead and install this. And in case you were wondering, if you haven't tried Windows 11 yet, if you're wondering how, you know, if it's good or if it sucks, um, I think it's great, actually. So far, I haven't had a single issue with it. I mean, maybe I just got lucky. But all of my programs that I was using, you know, previously, they're all working just fine. Like, I haven't had any issues. So, hopefully I didn't just jinx myself here and uh, Audacity will continue to work okay. But it says, app update checking, to stay update, you'll receive blah, 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 blah. Uh, and that looks a little different. That's like a new... Let's see. FFmpeg was configured in preferences and successfully loaded before, but this time Audacity failed to load it at startup. Uh-oh. Um, so let's just go preferences libraries to reconfigure it. All right, let's see if we can do that. Libraries. Okay. Oh, actually, do I even know where this is? Did that work? No. <laughs> Browse. No, I don't have anything. Okay, so probably gonna have to re-download it. Let's see if this works. Well, sorry, I didn't realize this was gonna be such a big pain in the butt. Uh, hey, Evernew, what's going on, man? Um, I think I can go without this for now. Let's just get to the Audacity stuff. I don't think I need FFmpeg for this little tutorial type thingy. So anyway. Let's go back to the preferences here. And like I was saying before, the main, the first thing I wanted to talk about was how I got the dark theme, because everybody was asking me that on some of my previous videos. And to do that, you just go here to interface, like you open up preferences. If you didn't see that, you open up preferences and then you click on interface. Then down here, you'll see theme. And then we have uh, several themes we can choose from. We can go to classic. Unfortunately, you have to do this every single time. You can't just, uh, you know, it won't show it to you. There's no preview of it. That's what I'm trying to say. So if I click light here, let's, I'll just go through all of them so you guys can see what they look like. Light one is pretty cool. I think that's what it defaults to now, maybe. Asking if I'm switching DAWs? No. Uh, Audacity is not a DAW. It's just a wave editor. Definitely not a DAW. Um... But I've always used Audacity. Audacity I use for certain things, like 
I always master all my albums in Audacity. And if I'm doing like uh, sample editing and things like that, I always use Audacity. Let's go back to... Pre okay, so there's the dark theme. We'll go back to preferences. High contrast is also a dark theme, but it's like crazy looking. As you can see right there. <laughs> Sorry, I keep losing the menu. And then what else is there? Custom. I've actually never messed with uh, custom. I think to do custom, you have to do like a, like there must be a custom text file somewhere. We can change colors because all it does is looks like that. But I think there must be a way to customize that, like a config file or something like that, which I've never really looked into. So if you really want to get into Audacity customization, you could do that, but I'm just going to leave it on dark because that's the one I like the best. Okay, so what other questions do I get asked um, all the time? One of them, uh, people ask me, like, uh, they'll say, oh, when I'm recording on Audacity, let's go ahead and just do an example here. When I'm recording on Audacity, um, actually, no, that's not going to record my mic. Let's see if, the, I, if I can even do that from here. Uh, primary. Oh, okay, yeah, I can. But will this cut off my sound? Let's see if this will cut off the sound from the stream. It may. You guys still hearing that? Stream. It may. You guys still hearing that? Okay, you are still hearing it. All right. So, um, let me go ahead and record a track here. Let's set this to mono, and then we'll go to which one? Can I do just three? See if this will work. Test, 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 test. I probably have to have my microphone's plugged into channel four, so I don't think that's gonna work. But I can I can do it like this. So sorry if this is confusing. But what I'm gonna do is just delete that. Test, test, test. Hello, hello, hello. And you can see it's recording me there on one channel. Right there. Okay, so I stopped that, but we could turn this into a mono channel easily. And to do that, all we have to do here is on this little drop-down arrow right here. And we just go to Split Stereo Track. And then we can just delete this one by clicking the X. And now you notice this one's panned all the way to the right because it used to be, um, you know, a right, the right channel. And all we have to do, if we want to get that right in the center, I mean, you could, you could drag this little thingy over like this. But if you really just want to do it easily, just double-click it and just push 0 on your keyboard and press Enter. And that puts it right in the middle. Okay, so one of the things that people ask me a lot, uh, hey Sebastian, is when they're recording, like overdubbing a track, sometimes what will happen is when they re-record their new track, for example, like this, I'm going to be recording, hello, testing, hello, testing. Hello. You can see it's recording hello. there on one Hello, track. hello, hello. And I know that was confusing to hear that. But what will happen is they'll say, well, the, the track that they had recorded first is showing up on the second track they record. But if you listen to mine, let me, oh, shoot, let me do that again. <laughs> uh, test, test, test. Test, uh, hello, 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 hello. Okay, let me not delete it this time by accident. And uh, I'm going to split this, do the same thing I did before. So let me just solo this track, and you can hear my previous track did not bleed. <laughs> Test. Hello, 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 hello. So I had no bleed of the other track there. So if you're getting bleed and you're hearing yourself, you know, your previous track on the second track that you overdubbed, there could be a couple of reasons for this. One, maybe you're using uh, speakers and you have the speakers up too loud. And it's just picking up on your mic. You know, that may seem obvious, but, you know, that can happen. Um, the other thing, though, there are certain sound devices. Uh, namely, I would say a lot of the inexpensive, like, Amazon sold um, inexpensive USB mixers. They have an issue where <clears throat> they don't route audio the correct way. Like... What happens is is basically the USB in and out signal gets crossed. And so like when you try to overdub on a, an existing uh, channel or on a, a new channel, the existing channel will show up 
exactly like, you know, on top of the other one. And I know this to be the, f the case because I actually had one of those mixers once. Uh, somebody sent me one. I think it was a newer uh, mixer. Excuse me. The company newer sent it to me. And no matter what I did, no matter what settings I changed on that mixer, it always did that. So in that particular situation, that was a hardware issue. And unfortunately, if that happens to you and you have one of those mixers, uh, you know, maybe even like some of the, the better ones may still do that too. Uh, there's no real way around it. It's just, you just can't do it, <laughs> unfortunately, because I pulled my hair out with that thing and there is just no way to fix it. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, the answer really is just to get an actual audio interface or, you know, just use a, you know, if you have a, a computer with a, a line in input on it, like in like a PC with a line input, Macs don't even really have them anymore. Um, but some of the PCs still do. But even some of those, if it's a laptop, laptop don't these days. So, yeah, I mean, really the best answer is just to get an audio interface. And when I, when I say an audio interface... Uh, you know, meaning like something that is designed specifically for recording. Uh, right at, what I'm using right now is a uh, Behringer UMC 404 HD, which is like a four channel audio interface. And it works great. I've had it for a long time. I mean, I have like a million uh, audio interfaces. They're laying around all over the place. I have like a couple task cams, um, Alesis, two Alesis. I just, you know, I always pick them up when I find good deals and, you know, cause I use them for various things. I have like an iRig, um, but there's a lot of them out there to choose from. One very popular one is the Focusrite. Uh, a lot of people use that one. The, I forget what the model name is, but very popular audio interface. So that's probably the reason. Um, another thing that people ask me a lot is if you're using Windows, how can you, re like, say I have a four-channel audio interface like I'm using right now. How do you record all four channels at the same time in Windows? And unfortunately, I know this isn't really helping, <laughs> but you can't. That's another thing, you know, people have asked me, like, a bunch of times. Uh, Sebastian has the fo focus right. Very cool. Um, you can't do it. And that is no fault of... Windows, actually, it's actually the fault of Audacity, and I'll explain why. It's because Audacity does not support uh, ASIO drivers yet. Well, actually, this is a new version. I didn't even read the, you know, the description there, what they changed. Let's check. Maybe they do now. Let's go in here to the audio uh, device. So Windows Direct Sound, and no, it's still not there. So if you saw here in this drop-down menu something that said ASIO, then you would be able to record multi-track audio, like true multi-track audio. Windows, like the Windows Direct Sound driver and MME driver and all of these Windows drivers are only capable of recording two audio channels in at once. And so you can see here, if I go down to recording and my drop-down menu, Every like selection I have here is either a single or a double. There's no four channels, even though all of these one, two, three, four, and then, well, actually this says one through four. Maybe this does do it now. I mean, this could be a Windows 11 thing. Let me try this. So let's see what happens here. Can I, no, see, you still only have the option of two channels. Um, so that's still not going to work, unfortunately. But what, what I... I'm actually confused now uh, to what will actually happen when I press record here. Test, 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 test. Uh, so actually nothing. So that's actually not even recording anything. So I have to go back to 3.4. That's the, the channel that I was using. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Yeah, there's my level. So that answers that, hopefully. Um, let's see comments here. Evernui, but the preamps are pretty good. Stuff we all get. Yeah, they are good. Um, yeah, that focus, right. has got to be like one of the most popular interfaces out there. Um, the reason why I went with the Behringer, this particular one was because for the price, it was like the best, uh, priced one that actually had four individual inputs in it at once. But now I have, uh, just sitting right over here. Let me show you guys this. This thing, it's a Tascam, what is this? 
US 1608. This thing is crazy. It has eight in eight. Actually, no. I think it has like 16 inputs. Yeah, 16 line input or 16 inputs, eight microphone preamps, and then like eight more just line level inputs. But <clears throat> I don't use it on this setup because I usually use this one when I'm like recording with you know a lot of mics doing like electro or doing acoustic drums rather than electronics. So I basically just have it sitting here right now. And it's huge, and it takes up a ton of space on my desk, so... Sorry, my, my hat keeps hitting the mic. <laughs> um, yeah, the Tascams actually are not even that expensive either. Um, they're crazy uh, cheap for what you get. Like, nothing else. You get no... There's no other audio interface out there that has that many channels for the price that these things are. I think they're like 250 or they're, I, I can't remember, but they're not that expensive. Um, anyway, back to audacity stuff. Anybody have any questions about audacity? Feel free to shout them out. Um, if not, I will just show you guys basically what I mostly use audacity for, which is mastering. And I've made a couple of tutorials, tutorials on this before. Um, but I might as well do something else, you know, I'll just run through a quick one, uh, just to give you guys a, you know, basic idea as to what I do here with this thing. And let's go, where's my stuff? I have so many hard drives. All right, so this will give you guys a chance to hear a brand new song. <laughs> And which one do I want to do? Okay, so we'll work on... This is the newest song that I've recorded. And, okay, so... <clears throat> one thing you have to keep in mind when it comes to mastering... Mastering... People tend to be confused by this term these days. Um, they think that it is like this, this thing that absolutely has to be done... And it's this big, complicated process where it can be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Let me read some of these comments. I'll explain that more here in a second. Uh, Evernewy says, I bought the Behringer 8 input one that I've been not using, but using. Uh, trying to sell my 2i2 says, oh, but everyone keeps lowballing me. Yeah, that's pretty common. <laughs> and I put it at the cheapest price you can find on the internet. People on the internet always lowball everything when possible. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so back on the mastering thing. Now, as you can see right now, this, this file's pretty hot. It's already very close to being mastered. And I know this because I'm the one who recorded it. You know, like, when I, I have a method where the way I record things, I have, like, a, a certain set of plugins, and I know exactly how they work. And I pretty much know the results I'm going to get from those plugins, uh, when I use them. So I actually start mastering basically in the mix because you can. <laughs> it's not like it's one of these things where, where like people say to do that, but you basically can, especially in 2021 with the type of software that's out there and the different plugins that are available. You could get songs to sound production ready right out of the mix. And the two things that I use a lot, um, on my mixes, on the master bus in my mixes, are the SSL uh, compressor from Waves and then the L1 Ultra Maximizer from Waves as well. So I have the SSL compressor uh, there before the maximizer, and then I have the maximizer, which is also a limiter. It's like a brick wall limiter and a maximizer. So <clears throat> I use those two plugins, but I don't put a ton of compression. I just a little bit. It's like a little touch of the SSL compressor to kind of glue the whole mix. And then the the Waves uh, L1 is where I kind of boost the volume a little bit, but I don't go crazy. Like I I I try to leave a little bit of headroom, but not a whole lot really. And so okay, so to really make this make sense, I'm going to have to pull in another audio file too. So I'm going to go ahead and open up one more. Um Let's not do it that way, because I don't even know where that is. Too many folders. Let's go back here to this, and then I'll drop in this one. 
Okay, so that one's even crazier. Like, that one's, like, really maxed out. This one's probably... I can tell just by looking at it, this thing's not going to need anything. Like, it's it's mastered already. Um, but let me go ahead and show you guys what I would do in this situation. So, first off, I'm going to... Wait, where's the slider tool? Okay, this is different. I guess it's now multi-tool? How does this work? Hmm. I actually don't know. <laughs> what is this do? Okay, that's not... Oh, okay. All right, let's see. I'm not sure I like this. All right, let's see. Okay, I get it. Okay, cool. All right, so this is a new feature in Audacity that I didn't know about. Before, there used to be this little horizontal arrow thing to move your files around. But now there's this multi-tool. So now you just kind of hold the, uh, you know, your cursor over the top of the waveform until it turns in that hand, and then you can drag it back and forth. So I'm going to drag it over here. Hold down control and mouse wheel down to zoom out. I'm just going to drag it over here to get it out of the way. Okay. So the first thing I do, uh, let me read some of this. Uh, I've heard some bee makers don't even need to master their tracks. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you don't a lot of times. Um, is demonic sweaters a soldier in the loudness war? I mean, I think that's like done. I mean, Everything's loud. We know it's all loud. I mean, honestly, music has been loud since, like, the 2000s. Since basically the late 90s until the 2000s. Like, as soon as there were MP3s, everybody was maximizing everything. <laughs> so, like, when people comment about that stuff, I'm just like, whatever, man. You do it, too. So, I'm not in a war, but I make them... Whoa, I make them loud. Okay, let me turn down my headphones because I just blew my head off there. All right, so... <clears throat> I don't want to play too much of these songs because these are brand new and I'm try trying to save them for you guys. Um, but, okay, so here's this. Actually, do you guys even hear that? Let me make sure I have my output selected. Audio output capture. Yeah, you guys should hear that. Okay, so what I'll do in this situation is... Listen a little bit here. And then let's listen a little bit here. So this one's this one would be basically that one is already so blown out. Like I'm just not gonna touch that. It's fine. Like and I already know it sounds fine. I've listened to it a bunch of times. Um and I did maximize that one quite a bit in the the mix. And also the reason why that one is so hot is I ran the drums uh through Basically, it was this. There's this plugin in uh, Audacity called Drum Bus that has like compressor and overdrive and all these things in it. So I was I was pushing the fuck out of the drums on that particular song because I wanted them to kind of be distort distorted. I'll play it a little bit so you can hear it. So I wanted it to be pretty hot. So that one's going to be the loudest track on the whole album for sure, I can tell. Um, so what I'm going to do is try to bring things up, you know, to kind of match this one. Now already, this one's already pre pretty close, even though it doesn't sound quite that hot. But you can tell if you look closely at the, the waveform, if you look you'll notice there's two sec like se sections of the wave. You have the outer section, which is like the darker orange, and then the inner section, which is the lighter orange. The inner section is basically what is going to be your perceived loudness. So if you look at that inner section, and it's actually pretty close to this one right here. Um, so I have a choice here. I could try to push this one a little bit louder. Not much, because it is very close, or bring this one down a little bit. So first I'm going to try to push this one just a hair louder, and we'll see what happens. So first off, I can go here to Effect, and then I just want to go in first and just go uh, to Normalize. Okay. Actually, no. I don't want to do that. What am I talking about? <laughs> Let's undo that. The one I always use is, what is it called? Amplify. Now, this is, okay, Audacity has a couple of weird things. Amplify is not what you'd think it is. 
Um, all right, let me give you an example of how to best... I'm going to go back to that normalize plugin. And I'm going to use this for another reason. So normalize, and I'm going to... Let's normalize this to minus 5, okay? Okay, so now it's like really low. I'm only doing this just to show you guys what Amplify actually does. So now we're going to go back to Effect, and then we'll go to Amplify. And now you'll see Amplify is basically... It's basically another normalize. Because you'll notice there where it says Amplification DB, it automatically found that the, the wave was 5 dB, D, minus 5 dB below 0 dB. So it managed to figure that out, and I'm just going to press OK. Normalize defaults to minus 1 for some reason. You can change it. I mean, they would literally do the exact same thing. If you just put 0 in Normalize, then it would do the same thing as this. But I don't know. I just always use Amplify just because it's one less thing to change. You just turn it, you just put it in there and do it. So that's going to get me, you know, in case that the mix for some reason wasn't, you know, put to like basically as high as it could go, that'll, that'll put it to where it can be the highest. <laughs> Talking so bad. Okay. I'm tired. All right. Let's go here to. <laughs> We'll go back to, uh, what was I going to say? Okay, so we're, now we're going to go to the limiter. Limiter is what makes things loud. Don't compress. Compress, if you compress in your master, especially if you compressed on the master bus of your mix, it's going to sound like ass. So just don't do it. Um, that's how you get that really like pumping sounding overly compressed sound as if you compress in your master. Um, I never use compression in the master. So don't do it. I mean, again, this is for my music. I shouldn't say don't do it because there might be a situation where that would make sense. But for what I do and the way I mix and master, it doesn't work. So what I use here, though, is I go to the hard limiter and that didn't work. So let's see what else we can use. There's other ways to do it. That must be a leftover plugin from an older version or something. So we're just going to select limiter. And I have two options here, but one of them is 32-bit. Uh, so I'm going to select the 64-bit one. Okay, so here's the new hard limiter. So right here, we can select limit type. Hard limit is basically like a brick wall limiter. And that is pretty much a master limiter. So the way that this thing works is if it's zero... On the input game, it's going to do nothing. Um, if you push it a little bit, for example, this one, I don't want to push too much. I'm only going to do like 1 dB, I think. Or not even. I'm just going to do 0.9. So I'll slide those up to 0.9. And I'm just going to click OK. We'll see. Okay, so you might not notice much of a change there, but it changed a little bit. Now let's listen. So now I just listen for distortion, you know, and hear if there's anything bad happening. And that sounds good to me. I mean, I'm I'm just doing this as an example. I'm not really mastering the album right now because I'm not even finished with it. But that's how I would do it. Um, so that sounds pretty good. And I think that looks pretty close. Like if we look at these two, compare them. Let's zoom in or let's, let's do this. We'll go to view and then we'll do track size, fit to height. So now we can really see them. And that looks pretty even to me. And then you also want to listen. You know, you don't just look, you have to listen to it. And what I'll do is I'll go like this. I'll just, I'll preview back and forth. I'll go. Like I'll just. Jump around to different spots. And that sounds even to me. So what is mastering really in 2021? It's just making things even. That's pretty much it. Um, I have more to say on that, and I'll tell you here in a second. But let me read some of these comments. Uh, Thomas asks, what drum module are you using on the new material? Uh, this is all the TD6. Um, it sounds like resonators applied to drums. I love that sound, <laughs> um, says Sebastian. 
What aspects of Audacity make it good or comfortable for mastering? I always see people mastering in their DAWs. Um, well, there's one thing that I really, really like that Audacity does and why I always use it. I mean, there's a couple things. One, I've been using it for a really long time, like for literally like at least 10 years, like at least, uh, probably longer than that. And But the other thing that I really, really like is when you are finally finished mastering the whole album, it has a wonderful export feature where you can export multiple files at the same time that all already have tags and IDs already set to them, and you can do it all at once. So what I do is I load every single track into one file like this, into one Audacity file like this, and then I export them all at once as individual files. And that is just, that right there, I think just makes it absolutely amazing. And you could do crossfades and all this stuff. And then when you export everything out, like if you want to make like a seamless album, you know, with like crossfades and all that stuff, then you have it. It's all like there. And Audacity is really good at that. You could do that as well in SoundForge, which is the one that I used to use a really, really long time ago, like really long time ago. Um, but it was actually more difficult in SoundForge than it is in, in Audacity to do all that stuff. It was just more complicated. Um, okay, so what else I would do? Well, okay, I'll give an example of that. I'll do, like, say this is a whole album here. A two-song album. <laughs> so first off, let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to zoom in here. And I'm just going to trim off my crap at the beginning. Okay. Oh, I'm still on the multi-tool. Actually, I'm kind of liking this multi-tool. I can select. Let's see what else I can do with this thing. I can lower the wave. Does that lower the, the output? Let's see. I think it does. I think that's a volume curve. That is a volume curve because look, there's a point there. Yep. This is really cool. This multi-tool is very, very cool. What happens if I double click? Okay, so there's a point. Look at that. That is awesome. It just got so much cooler. The fact that it can do that now. I mean, you could do that before, but it was it was more complicated. Like, having this all on one tool like this is a big step forward. And also, I feel like there's more detail in the wave display there. That looks really nice. Okay, so I'm zooming out. Okay, now I'm going to go to the end here. Let's zoom in on the end. Hear what that sounds like. Some symbol decay there, pretty long. And actually, I'm fine with that ending. I like the symbol decay there. So I'm just going to slide this one over. But the beginning of this one, I want to trim. So let's trim that off. Okay, so to, oh, I didn't even describe what I was doing there. I just highlighted. Let me un undo. Control Z is undo. So I'm still on the multi tool. I'm hovering over the middle area here until I get that symbol on the cursor. And then I just drag, click and drag, and then press the delete key on the keyboard. And it automatically pulls the wave over uh, from whatever you deleted. So I'm just going to grab this and snap it back over there. Just like that. All right, so now let's hear the transition. All right, that sounds fine to me. Um, let's read these comments. Thomas says, I think Reaper just added something like that in the export options. Uh, it could have. I don't like mastering in Reaper, though, uh, because I, th I like to record in it, but I've just never gotten a good result uh, with mastering. I mean, I'm not saying it's it's not possible. It's just this is what I'm used to. This is I have a system, and I do it like the same way every single time. Uh, and so that's just what I do. Um, Rock Chuck says, hi, I'm new. Is it possible to cover a song on Audacity using drums and how to save just the drum sound only after done the cover? Thank you. Yeah, it's totally possible. I'll talk about that here once I, I finish up with what I'm talking about, about exporting. Okay, so this is my full album now, uh, my, my two song album. So let me scroll out and just, we're just going to leave that end on there. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to the beginning just rewind back, and I'm going to press, hold down control, press the letter B. Okay, now that what that did is created something called a label track down here on the bottom. And this is really cool. So I'm just going to, you know, first, I'm going to type in the name of this song, which is, what is the name of that song? Leandro. 
okay and then press enter and now i'm going to click over here if you hover the mouse you see how that yellow line comes up on the page that tells you you're right on the edge i'm just going to click there control b again that creates another label and then i'm going to name this one okay misspelled it if you're wondering why these titles are also weird because they're all they're all named after uh computer viruses that's the concept of the new album everything is named after a computer virus anyway okay so i have my labels there so now i'm going to go here to file and then export then i go export multiple right here okay then i'm going to choose my folder and then i'm just going to put them on the desktop and let's just create a like a test folder here to export to okay so i'm going to save them there and now i'm going to select flac files always master to flac it's not compressed but it still has tags like mp3s that's why i like it you could do wave but you could do mp3 too sometimes i will do mp3 if i'm making like a demo to, to post somewhere then i'll do mp3 but uh, flak files is usually what i master to and now here where it says split files based on we just go to labels like that and now that's going to create a new file for every one of these labels on this label track that i created and then down here i do numbering before label track name and what that will do is it'll put zero one before the first track and that's in the file name not on the tag with the file name um, one thing though is i forgot to talk about the tag so let's fix that first before i export I'm going to go here to edit. And we're going to go to metadata. Now, for metadata, what I'm going to do is I'm only going to put in a couple of things. I'm going to put in the name of the artist. No track title. And then I'm going to put in the album title, uh, which is going to be Happy 99. And then track number, leave blank. You can put in year. Genre, you can put in whatever you want. Smack, and then comments, nada. You don't have to put anything in comments. Um, okay, then I'm just going to click OK there. So now you'll see what will happen when I go back to that file, export multiple. And then numbering before uh, label track name, we click export. Now what's going to happen is it didn't do it. <laughs> Why not? Oh, because I, already, I guess I turned that off. Okay, let's let's look at it on the, the file that I created. So let's just close all this stuff. And why is it empty? Did I not select that test? Okay, I'm losing it here. Let's do that again. Here's... All right, I think I messed something up. <laughs> Great example there, Justin. You really know what you're doing. All right, let's go back here to export. What did I do wrong? Export multiple. Oh, because I, I forgot to choose the folder again. So now I have this extra files in my drumless library. I need to fix that. So let's go back to desktop at a test. And overwrite existing files. That's fine. So I'm guessing, let's do this export again. It used to confirm like what you wanted to name the files and the metadata, but let's see if it, if it figured it all out on its own. So let's go back here to test. There it is. And yeah, it did. So if we look here, remember what I was talking about? When you export multiple in the tags. So what I did, remember I just put in the artist and the album name and the tag there and the metadata, but it automatically, it was smart enough to figure out what the song title was based on the label. And same with here. So now we have the album, contributing artist, title, and name. And if I wanted to show more columns here, I can go to uh, year. So it shows the year. What else? Type, date created, album artist, should say demonic sweaters, and it does. So it populates all that stuff, you know, perfectly, which is really, really cool. It's just very useful. Um, metadata, Sebastian, is basically like when you have an MP3 or a FLAC file and you're playing it, on a player <laughs> it's what shows you who the artist and the song name is like on you know the device so you need to have metadata on your files like uh a lot of times though when you're uploading to like spotify and all that stuff you have to fill in all that stuff manually anyways but if you wanted to like say if i want to open this song 
let's just open this in uh, open with groove music now it's going to show see here it's scrolling by demonic sweaters and it shows the title there if i hadn't put in that metadata then it would just say the name of the file and then say like unknown artist or something like that uh, so it keeps everything nice and organized in the way it should be so yeah that's really really useful and then also all the tracks are numbered the correct way so they're all in order so if i were to just like open up a player let's open up vlc here and say if i grab these two files and just drag the whole folder in there it's going to play them in the right order because i that's th that metadata so everything will play the correct order it says it says the name of the album right there it says the name of the artist uh somewhere and then you can also put an album cover if you drop a, a cover like if you drop a jpeg in this like right here actually if i just do this okay now if i play this file see now it shows the cover right there in that little cover area because if you have just cover.jpg in the folder that you're playing from, any player will just automatically figure out that's a cover for the album. That's how it works. So move that back out of there. All right, so on to the drum cover stuff. Um, did I close? Oh, no, here it is. So say you wanted to record a drum cover to this particular song right here, Leandro, my song. You have your drums. Let's get rid of all this stuff. You have your drums plugged in and hooked up to the computer. Excuse me. And they're, you know, they're plugged in left and right input uh, one and two, let's say. You know, like here. All right. And then you press record. And you play along. It's recording down here. I should actually record something so it actually is a better example. Let me see. How can I do this? Um, I can't play my drums. It's too late. But what I can do is play some synth. <laughs> so let me turn on one of my synths here. Whoa, I'm going to have to finagle some things to make this work. Now, like I said before, Audacity... Actually, no, I didn't say that in this tutorial. I've said it in the other ones, but Audacity doesn't do MIDI. But that doesn't mean that I can... I have my ways to uh, make MIDI work, which is using something MIDI called MIDIOX. So now here in MIDI Ox, I'm, I'm going all over the place in this, this video, but I'm going to select my MIDI input right here, which is my DMK25. Then my MIDI output, I'm going to select the Model D, which is the synth I have hooked up. Click OK. It's actually making sound, even though you don't hear it. Um, but if I click... Actually, hold on. I need to change my input because that is plugged in what? That's in three. So I'm going to have to go back to three, four. Okay, now if I do this, start monitoring. Okay, so you see the synth level. You're not going to hear it until I start recording. So let me just, I'm just going to play noise over this. Okay, so we have a little synth recorded there. And let me just play that back. Okay, now it's in that one channel, like I said before. I'm going to split this just so I can make this a mono. Split stereo to mono. Let's delete the blank track. And then we're going to put this one in the center. Okay. All right, so... Basically, I already did what you were asking. So what I did there is I recorded on another channel. And the way to do that is basically you have your song loaded into Audacity already on one channel. Then as soon as you press record in Audacity, it's automatically going to create a new channel and start recording on that. So if I were to press record again... You'll notice how it created a whole other channel there. 
And actually, I could have talked over that, so let's do. Okay, so now we have. Let's get rid of the blank side again. Okay, so now I have those two new tracks that I put there, but if I want to hear just one of those, I can just press solo. There's just the keys. There's just the vocals. And there's just the song. And so if you wanted to save the whole thing as a file, you know, export all of this as one file, you could basically just leave it as is with everything unmuted and then go to file and then export. And you can export as MP3, WAV, or AUG. AUG is another type of audio file. Uh, you can do multiple, like I did before, if you have multiple tracks in there. But right now, for this example, you probably just want to do WAV, like if you're going to put it in a video uh, for like a, a drum cover or something. WAV is probably going to be what you would want to use. Uh, but if you wanted to just export just the drums, then all you'd have to do is just solo the drum channel. And then do the same thing, just export. So whatever you hear, like whatever you have set up in Audacity, uh, like in what you're hearing when you play back Audacity is exactly what will export when you export the file. So that's basically all you have to do. It's really simple. Um, another thing too, some people don't realize uh, that Audacity actually has, or it used to, let's see if it's still there, a mixer right here. It has a mixing board which is really funny, like, but it does. And it's not, I never really use it. It's not super useful, but if you like having a mixer, you know, you can use your, use that as your, you know, adjusting your levels and your left and right. One cool thing about it is it always seems to, well, it didn't get this one right. In this case, it, it thought Leandro was drum. So it put a drum, you know, icon there, but sometimes it seems to figure out what you recorded. Like if you play guitar, like it'll put a guitar icon there. And then, like, figure it out. You can change that icon uh, manually, too, somehow, I think. Uh, maybe not. Used to be able to, I thought. But, yeah. Um, it's pretty, pretty easy. Closing MIDI aux. Let's see if there's any comments. Nope. So, anybody have any other questions or comments about Audacity? Um now, of course, to hear back the music while you do your drum cover in Audacity, uh, first you would want to make sure that you did the latency compensation uh, thing <laughs> in Audacity before you even do that. Because if you don't, I'll explain what that is, but if you don't do that first and you record your, co your cover and play it back, it's going to sound out of sync. And the reason why is because when you record on computers, there's something called latency, and DAWs generally correct it automatically after you record, like make things line up, but Audacity doesn't until you set it up. So to do that, you have to do... Well, actually, I'm not going to go through that in this video because I made a whole video on that already. Uh, let me find the video, and I'll post it in the chat. Let's go into YouTube here. And... You guys are seeing, this is going to be like a crazy mirror effect, but that's okay. Let's go to my channel. And then... Okay, so the first thing you're going to want to do is this. And I'll post the chat uh, this in the, the chat of the video here. I mean, you could find it too, just by, if you're watching this later, just go there. You could find it too. Just okay. <laughs> Not back into this mirror stuff again. Endless loops of me talking. So I post that there. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, once you do that, what it does is basically it's a way to measure how much latency your computer, your audio signal has in Audacity. And then you put in a number in the settings, and then it makes it so when you record that everything matches up. If you don't, you'll record your drum cover, and you'll you'll 
get through it and you'll think, God, I played that horribly. <laughs> because like you sound completely out of time when you listen back but it's it's probably well you could have played it horribly but it'll make it sound even more horrible than you played it or maybe you played it great and then it'll still make it sound horrible so definitely do that before you even attempt to do um the thing the computer has drawn you yeah this is sebastian speaking of that you guys like my desktop background i drew this let me show you I drew that on an Amiga, Amiga 500, uh, using Deluxe Paint. Actually, no, I lied. It was a, an Amiga 500 emulator. Sorry. It was the Raspberry Pi uh, Amiga 500. Uh, what was that thing called? Raspian. Yeah, that was really cool. I, I, I don't think that's being developed anymore. I'm, I was thinking about getting back into that recently, but I just have too much crap. There's nowhere to put anything. But yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Um, Sebastian says, what's my, my favorite synth? Um, you know, I love them all, actually. <laughs> Sitting here, right, I've been meaning to do, the, probably the next video I do is going to be about all these synths. Because I have a lot of synths sitting, they're just all around me right now. I have, right now, there's a Behringer uh, D, Model D. Uh, the Cat, I love the Cat. The Cat is so cool. The Crave, uh, the TD3, and then the Kawhi K1. All these are like sitting right here. And then I also have in my storage unit, there's the um, the Korg uh, DS1, which the only reason why it's in the storage unit is just because it's huge. I don't have space for it right now. Um, and I can get away with not having it. So, you know, that's why I have, I have it in there. Uh, what else? I think that's all I have right now. But I love them all. I mean... I try to bounce, like, when I'm recording, I'm like, oh, you know, I haven't used this one in a while, so I'll, I'll start off with the one I hadn't used in a while. You know, so I kind of cycle through them, you know, just to keep it fresh. Um, I really like the cat a lot because it just does so much for a cheap analog synthesizer. Like, it's crazy how much you can do with that thing. Uh, the Crave, too, the Crave is, like, surprisingly powerful because it has, like, that modular section on it, which you can do quite a bit with that, too. It's a lot of fun. They're all cool. Uh, the analog stuff's a lot of fun to play with. Uh, the Model D is very cool, for sure. Uh, the Model D set has... Well, they all have their own distinct sound. The Model D, I, I like for certain things, like kind of a mid-range kind of sound. Doing like a, a vocally kind of lead with it. Uh, I like to do that with the... And plus the, the fact that it has three oscillators, you can get like a nice, you know, you can get those like fifths, you know, going and stuff like that. And it sounds really cool. It sounds really old school. Um, like there's this one I did. I'll play a little bit of it. Um, that's like just, I think this is all, uh, it's wrong. Sorry, I can't talk and, and navigate at the same time. Let me figure out where I am first. So much data. Where is all this stuff? Okay, so this one, let me just play a little section of it. I think this is all the leads here are the Model D once it kicks in. Yeah, it's got that very, like, 70s, spacey kind of sound to it. I, I, it's really cool. But they're all really cool. Like, they all sound great. The Behringer stuff is so cool. All these synths that they do. I mean, I'm sure the original companies that made these things, well, especially, like, Moog, the ones that are still selling them, probably hate Behringer. <laughs> because, like, like the basically, the, the Behringer Crave is pretty much the Moog, uh, what is it, Mother 32. Um, but it's like a third of the cost or something, or a fourth of the cost. I mean, it's it's like literally the same synth. I mean, the, the sound, I've watched comparison videos. The sound, very, like, difference is so minimal. Like, it's very, very, mi like, minuscule. Like, you can hardly tell. So, and they have, like, the same exact sequencer. I don't really even like the sequencer on the, the Crave, honestly. 
or the the mother 32 i never use it like i think it's really wonky it's hard to use that was that was moog's invention too um the one that's in the in the the td3 is actually pretty good but it's weird too but it's kind of fun to use so anyway time is it wow it's already 11 i think i'm going to sign off and the Model D is supposed to be a mini Moog, right? Says Sebastian. Yeah, basically it is. Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. And the cat is a cat. <laughs> it's like they didn't even change the name. They just called it a cat. That's what the cat was, too. Like, basically the same exact thing. If I were to recommend one of them, though, like, out of all of them, it'd be the cat. Like, the cat is the one I kind of wish I'd bought first because of a couple of things for one it's not even totally a mono synth um it's actually paraphonic you can get two you know you could play the two oscillators separately at the same time so you could play one note on one key and another note on another key all of the other ones are monophonic so just having that alone which allows you to play you know very minimal like two note chords and stuff but that's actually pretty pretty powerful to be able to do that on an analog synth and one that's that cheap and then plus it has the ability to route things in a really really interesting way uh <clears throat> it's not a typical layout and actually the cat see what's interesting about the cat is the original cat was basically a copy of the arp odyssey <laughs> so <clears throat> Behringer actually makes an ARP Odyssey clone as well. So they actually make, but the, the cat is a copy of the ARP Odyssey. So they're kind of essentially the same thing, except the ARP Od the, the Odyssey, the Behringer Odyssey costs more than the cat because it has a keyboard on it. But they're essentially the same kind of, they work in a very similar way, the way that they route things. Um, like, for example, you can route oscillators um in a more crisscross you know oscillators and and envelopes and lfos in a more crisscross way whereas like you can send them back and forth through each other whereas on the model d it's kind of like a one-way direction the way the signal flows whereas on the cat and the arp odysseys it's it's more like crisscross if that makes sense like it's really weird and when you first get it it's kind of like you're just sort of like what the f like it's a little bit strange to figure out how to use it but once you figure it out you're like whoa like this thing is really cool and what you could do too is like even do like generative stuff with it where like like i'll play this other thing this is kind of noise but this was the cat just doing all of this on its own like i was not touching it while it was doing this And it just morphs over time, you'll hear. So yeah, it's got like, just can do very interesting stuff like that, that the other ones really can't do. Um, you can maybe get some generative sounding stuff out of the, the Crave too, because of the patch bay on it. Uh, but really you can't on the Model D. But the Model D is really great for leads and stuff like that and basses. The Crave, though, I think is better for basses. Uh, but the Model D is really good for leads. The Cat is really good, like, all around. You can do basses. You can do leads. Uh, you can do really pretty sounding stuff with it, really abrasive sounding stuff with it. It's just a, a really, really cool synth. Uh, so maybe that's my favorite one. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the K1, too, the Kawhi K1, it's a digital synth, and I've been using that since 2006 or 2005. I love the K1. The K1 is on more of my music than any other synth. It's If you go back to my oldest albums, you'll hear K1, always. And it's on the newest one, too. So there's always a use for the K1 for me. Anyway, what started out as an audacity base video turn into a, vi uh, a synth video but that's okay um i should sign off here though it's getting late and i'm getting tired and i'm not even making sense and i'm talking anymore anyway guys thanks for watching and if you have any questions or comments if you're watching this in the future feel free to post them down below and i'll talk to you guys really soon have a great night